Okay, very briefly, um, this is the schedule, and as you can see from the time, we're already a few minutes, uh, you know, late. Uh, that's okay, we'll make up for it, I'll just talk faster. Um, but uh, one of the things about this short course, and I think this is true about the others that have been held, is that it's going to be interactive. You're not just going to be sitting, listening to people talk. Um, and that's especially going to happen in the last session where we're going to break people up into small groups and you're basically going to design a framework for a MOOC of your choice. Um, uh, right off the bat, we've got a, 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 some quick comments from a variety of people who have a variety of experiences uh, with MOOCs, distance education, and so forth. So um, I'm going to turn things over to John right now, and let me bring the PowerPoint back up. As Kim mentioned before, about two years ago, I had a conversation with her about these things called MOOCs. And I got to say that, you know, I know very little or nothing about MOOCs. It's just that I had a conversation with her, and that's my contribution to this workshop. Um, but it was motivated by two things, uh, two experiences that I had in my life. One was, I remember Constitution Rock on Saturday mornings, and that is how I memorized the preamble to the Constitution. And I showed it to one of my uh, classes. I occasionally teach uh, Intro to American Government every three years, and I had my class of 500. And I showed them Constitution Rock, you know, uh, the cartoon, and I asked how many had seen it, and only about a third had ever seen it. And I'm thinking, well, that's how I learned the Constitution, it was from that little jingle on a cartoon that at that time, in 1960-whatever, uh, people assumed that a grade school child would understand that. And now our college students don't understand it. Oh, I got to stand over here. Yes, Second, uh, I had uh, the, uh, it, what happened shortly before I talked to Kim was, uh, not shortly, but around the same time. Uh, I had a, a young man come to my office late at night, and I was working. And I have cartoons on my door, and he was admiring the cartoons. And then, you know, he looks into my office. I have a copy of the Constitution that I got from the Constitution Center on my wall, and he goes, Oh, that, that looks like the Constitution, is it? I said, yes, it is. And he goes, well, that's a very, very neat document. And then, then he looks at my door, and there's a cartoon that's critical of something called the SEC. And he goes, what's the SEC? I said, the Security Exchange Commission. He goes, what's that? I said, well, that's you know, a regulatory agency that supervises activities on Wall Street. And he goes, oh, that's interesting. He goes, by the way, I'm running for Congress. <laughs> No, that's a true story, and I think I won't say what for which party, but that was um, horrifying to me. And it, and I don't. I actually, I think he came in second <laughs> because he kept saying we need to keep to the Constitution, a document which he really did not know. But uh, motivated by that, I, I, I started to think, uh, you know, what what can we do about this? And then I, th I thought that, you know, maybe one thing that we can do is that we can provide a public service of sorts. That maybe our role is to help improve the quality of citizenship in this country. To make people aware of at least some of the basic elements of the system in which they live so they won't, well, so they'll stop making such stupid choices. I mean, I think the reason why we have the politicians we have is because we have a citizenry that doesn't know how to choose or what, how the system works or what to know. And now, who's better equipped to handle this? Who's better equipped to push this information out than us? Now, I gotta say, I know little or nothing about MOOCs. I don't design web pages. I can barely figure out how to turn my computer on, especially when I get a new one. But I, knew, I do know that technology has changed the game. It has provided a unique opportunity for us to play an important role to demonstrate to those on Capitol Hill that we can do something important. And that's why I started thinking of MOOCs. Not that I know anything about them, but I know they're massive, and I know they're online, and I know they are open. <laughs> and that is the extent of my contribution to this workshop. And I'd like to turn it over to Chad Raymond, uh, upon which you know, I've completely free rode, as, as, as was you know, my rational choice, and I, <laughs> I let Chad do all the work. But anyhow, that's, that's my contribution. Thank you.
Well, on that upbeat note, uh, I'm going to bring the tone down quite a bit, probably. Uh, I'm going to say a few words on technological innovation and the coming paradigm shift in higher education. In the early 1900s, uh, the typical factory switched out the huge steam engine in its basement for a large electric motor but it still used a mass of belts and pulleys to transmit power from this centralized source to the factory floor. So really not much had changed. This is also how distance education has been conceived of for over a century. Information from a single instructor employed by a single university that is transmitted outward to multiple students at a distance whether via the mail, radio, television, or the internet, still requiring a very large and very expensive physical infrastructure. Now, not very long after electricity replaced steam, manufacturers realized that small motors distributed throughout a factory were much more efficient than the old belt and pulley system because they could generate power where and when it was needed. This is one of the potentials of MOOCs. Education when and where it's needed at a fraction of the cost of what traditional higher education can provide. But even if we ignore MOOCs for a moment, our colleges and universities are organized to function in an environment that for a great many people simply no longer exists. The traditional paradigm of undergraduate education in the USA, the tremendously expensive full-time, four-year residential campus college experience has become less and less grounded in reality. Currently, about one in three undergraduates are older than 24 years of age. More than one in three are part-time, 40% attend community colleges, and for every 118-year-olds in the USA, we now have only 95 four-year-olds. This means that the population of students that our higher education system is designed to serve is now significantly smaller in number, more culturally, more culturally diverse, less affluent, and less academically prepared than that of previous decades. So MOOCs might be a solution to this problem, or at least part of one, but whether they are or not, the landscape of higher education in this country is changing drastically. The demand for education across all sectors of society will continue to exist, but our educational institutions will have to radically transform themselves if they are going to be capable of meeting this demand. Now, institutions almost always try to preserve the problem to which they are the solution. So I will caution people not to treat, treat MOOCs as the, as the giant electric motor in the factory basement, connected to students with the same old institutional belts and pulleys. That system is no longer able to cost efficiently meet the demands of the majority of the people who are seeking higher education. So at this point, um, I'll turn it over to our next panelist. Michelle, do you want to go? Or either you or Nanette, which, whichever. Okay. Hi, my name is Michelle Deerdorf, and I th think I'm here because I'm the chair of the Standing Committee of Teaching and Learning um, for APSA. So um, I'm more in a position where John is. <laughs> this isn't something I've done, but it is something I've been thinking about, but in terms of what I would think of as public political science. Um, so when I started teaching, um, there was no web that we had access to, those of us who were at smaller institutions. No email, no voicemail, and so when technology came, it, what it enabled us to do is do what we were already doing and just do it quicker, more efficiently, do it better, but it didn't really change the way we think about the work we're doing. And what I've always thought about um, being of the, I'm Gen X, of early, early Gen X, um, of being of that point, it was a kind of a bridge generation that we did it all by hand before, and then, so, techno so technology was exciting and it didn't scare us, but it led us to be able to pick and choose what technology we wanted to use, when we wanted to use it, 
And, and what I came to realize is that it shouldn't just enable us to do what we've done previously, just quicker and more efficiently, but it should lead us to ask new questions, um, go in new directions, and rethink the way we're doing everything. And I've seen that in my classroom, as I'm sure many of you have, that it's not just that we teach the same way, but instead of cutting out the New York Times um, article and photocopying it and giving it to students, I now can project it up or, or put it on Blackboard. It's a, you know, I can do much more exciting things than that um, in addition. The second thing I've been thinking about, um, so, so not only does technology and uh, around learning make us think about different questions and ask new questions and approach it in new ways, but I've been thinking about my uh, colleagues in history a lot. Um, I do, a, in, in another part of my life, I do a lot of work on civic engagement um, in terms of the civil rights movement and popular sovereignty issues. And so I work with a lot of public historians, and I've been thinking, what is the equivalent of the public historian for the political scientist? What is public political science? And I think that's something as a discipline we're embracing more and we're asking that question more. What is it that we do that engages with the public? And so one of the, I, I don't have any answers this morning. I just have some questions I've really begin, I'm beginning to kind of think about a lot. Um, what are the new questions? What are the new ways in which we engage with the public? and a democracy that these kinds of technologies provide? What are the new ways we can think about democracy? Um, that we can think about civil discourse, which we've not done very well. Um, what are the ways we can think about political, um, I don't want to call it political education, because that, that's not what I mean, but, but the, the um, education of what it means to be a citizen of democracy. What does it mean to be a popular sovereign? Um, how do we do democracy differently? And I'm not talking about voting. Um, though that's obviously part of it, um, how do we rethink what it means to be a citizen? How do we rethink about how we teach, not students, but people about what it means to be a citizen? I mean, I think we have huge opportunities to rethink things um, both structurally as a nation, obviously within the educational system, but I think even beyond the educational system. Um, and what role do we want to play as a discipline uh, what role do we want to play as educators? And thinking about our classrooms being more than just college students, being more just the people in front of us, but frankly, a nation as a whole. And in a nation like ours, and with the, the state of civic discourse as it is today, I, I think that's a pretty urgent question. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to broaden the horizon a bit and introduce you to what I see today, and I've been tracking MOOCs since John began to think about them. And I've actually been thinking about them globally because my field is international relations and international development. And I've been trying to track developments in England, and we have some incredible representatives, and I look forward to chatting with them, brainstorming with them later, uh, in France. And yes, even in China. Um, it's incredible how this idea of MOOC has taken off. So I want you to think about what's happening today as perhaps I'm thinking about it, as a mosaic with many different tiles in many different patterns. And when I say MOOC, it might not be the same thing as when John and Michelle and Chad talk about it, or as when Stephen talks about it, or as when my colleagues in China or in France speak about it. Um, and so I call it the alphabet soup of MOOCs, because no longer are there just MOOCs, massive online open courses, as John introduced us to, but there are CMOOCs and XMOOCs, and um, I'm not sure if you know what fun is, but I know you know what fun is. <laughs> but fun is the France Université Numérique. It was just announced on October 28th in France. The French government, top down in its natural cultural style, uh, announced it was giving 21 million euros to French institutions to design MOOCs. Now, I need to tell you, MOOCs did exist in France before. One was even partnered, I believe, with Coursera. Um, but the French government, interestingly, is partnering with EdX, 
Uh, and what's even more interesting is they have announced that they're using Cap Gemini, a French firm, to quote unquote coordinate because, of course, there was a lot of uh, notice in the press that they were partnering with an American partner. Um, more about that later, but I should mention Spocks to you. And the reason I have Spocks up there in my alphabet soup is that the president of Stanford, John Hennessy, just announced, reported in the Financial Times just two days ago, I think, or maybe three days, February 2nd, I believe, um, that he was not so enamored of MOOCs anymore. He felt that massive didn't work, that open didn't work, and he basically called for what we're calling SPOCs, uh, small private online classes. So we can chat about that a little bit later on. I want to also move on. So first, I've talked about the myriad definitions, and we need to be very clear what we're talking about as we design our MOOCs later on in our small groups. What, what, are, we, what are we talking about? And then I want to give a broader view based on my own work um, and that of my colleagues with whom I've worked on distance uh, challenges for many, many, many years. We're um, early adopters. Um, we used to talk about, and I wrote about something called the triple track in distance education. I said we have to look not only at faculty and staff, but also at administrators uh, as we think about doing these things. And now I am saying that we must think about the quadruple track. Any guesses to the fourth partner on that track? What's the fourth track now, the fourth possible track? Close, the technical people, it's those private organizations, some of which are for profit, um, that raise lots of issues for us. Um, they're out there, they're partnering with us, there are many different kinds, you've heard some of their names. Um, I've written about some of them, but I think we've got to think about those issues. There are many, many issues. And those relate to what I call the absorptive capacity angle, the ACA angle, for, we love acronyms in Washington. Um, the absorptive capacity angle for MOOCs. In other words, and going back to your comment on the technical, there's technical absorptive capacity. How much capacity do we have as faculty? Um, you're going to hear from people later on who are actually doing MOOCs now, and they will tell you about the kind of technical support they have or they do not have. And it ranges. It ranges in the United States by type of institution. It also uh, is different in different parts of the world. Um, and as you saw in my French example, the French government um, is providing funding for those kinds of resources and actually encouraging partnering as well. And my final point for us as we think about MOOCs, uh, especially I, I have to, I cannot separate my uh, passion for international affairs and international relations and my knowledge of the, the lack of history, not just domestic, but the lack of our students' knowledge of international history, of Vietnam, of, of uh, just, I could go on and on. But that leads me to my final point this morning that I hope will shape our discussions later on. And again, it's based on my research. And that is that MOOCs that are just focused on the United States also have to recognize we have different cultural context within the United States. We're a very diverse nation. But most MOOCs also have students from all over the world. And that raises some very interesting questions in terms of cross-cultural communication and trust and different cultural styles for learning. So I want to leave you with those questions and also with this very broad panorama of both opportunities that I think were highlighted by Michelle, John, and Chad in their remarks, but also to remind you that there are myriad issues and issues that I think raise opportunities for us, not just as teachers, but also in terms of the science of education and political science for rigorous research surrounding MOOCs and the way in which we are designing and implementing them, often using the quadruple track. Thank you. OK, we had uh, one member of the uh, panel who uh, couldn't make it because of a family emergency, but he has prepared a video. Yes, exactly. Okay. So, 
It's, it's number three. <laughs> so what I'm going to attempt to do is move this mic close enough to the audio coming out of my laptop. Hopefully it'll be picked up OK. We'll, we'll see. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim Quirk, and I'm really sorry I can't be there with you today, but I know it's going to be a terrific conference. I just wanted to talk for a couple of minutes about MOOC from a student's perspective. I took a MOOC last spring on global poverty from MIT, specifically for the purposes of seeing what might be helpful in my own classroom and in my own online courses. I want to talk about a couple of the ideas that I've thought about since then. Two general points, first of all. It's always the learning and the student engagement, not the technology. That's the overall point. And the second is that students are both online and mobile. We need to know about the software they're using, applications, Facebook, Twitter, Blackboard, all these kinds of things, but also the hardware they're using. I did a survey uh, presented last month at a conference that students are not only doing their, write, their reading assignments on their telephones, they're increasingly doing their written assignments on their telephones. So both online, but also mobile hardware and software and hardware questions. Couple notes on course design. Obviously, we always want a clear course description and a course uh, objectives. But even more important, maybe, is that is how crystal clear, how explicit a syllabus has to be. All the links have to work, sure, these kinds of things. But also, due dates have to have not only times but time zone information. So that was one of the changes they had to make midway through their MOOC last time was. People didn't have that information. So every little detail really needs to be attended to in the syllabus. Something else we already do in our classrooms is multiple means of, of providing the content and multiple means of assessment. For content in the MOOC I took, there was a textbook, video lectures, transcript of those lectures, PowerPoints, quizzes, tests, and all were pretty seamlessly integrated. The idea that there's multiple ways to get at the same information, to present it in different ways that aren't identical, but they're complementary and they match uh, this idea of multiple uh, ways to provide the content. There are some things we can do ourselves that match this. This is the idea, for example, of video lectures. You might decide that you want to put your whole 50 minute Sage on Stage lecture online for students so they can go back and look at it. But maybe more practical is a short two-minute introduction to what we're going to talk about in class today, or two or three minutes reviewing the major points of what we did. And students can go back and make sure that they have the understanding that you hope they have. Next item, communications. There's a couple different parts here. One is useful feedback. When I took a quiz, it told me whether my choice was correct or not correct, and it had a link back to the video and the transcript and the PowerPoints and the text of where that information was covered. So if I didn't understand it, I was able to go back and learn it again. Uh, a second idea is what if I have an admin question? Who do I have a question? If I have a question about the syllabus or the technology, is there somewhere I can go? And what if I still don't understand? The MOOC had online chat rooms which were filled with, there were 38,000 students in the class. There was a lot of people. But one thing I liked was after a couple of weeks, some of the students were given a little gold star um, indicating in the chat room that somebody has identified their comments as possibly more helpful than other people's comments. I thought that was really good. Overall, we've had distance education for a long time. If you watch Downton Abbey, they're taking correspondence classes by mail. Uh, radio lectures were offered in the middle of the century. In the 70s and 80s, television in the classroom was going to change education. And we've had online distance education for a long time. Now we have high speed and rich, uh, rich content and social media and mobile devices. All these things are important and interesting and we need to attend to them. But most of all, I think we need to remember that it's always student engagement and student learning that should take priority over just the technology no matter how good and interesting and useful it gets. Thanks so much. I hope you have a terrific conference. And please contact me if you have any questions. Thanks again. So that was Jim Quirk. And again, if you do have questions for him, um, I've distributed his, his email before, but I can do so again. If anyone needs it, just get in touch with me. OK, so now it's time to open things up for discussion. We have. 
Oh, I'm sorry. No, come on up. You're... The privilege of going last is I don't I can just say, yeah, what they said and they said. Um, but my name is Tressa Tabaris, and um, like Michelle, I think we were talking about, well, why am I here? I don't do MOOCs. I don't. Um, but I think I'm here. I do do online and fully online um, education, and I do teach at a community college in California. So uh, many of the I, you just resonate with me, even just in our traditional classrooms, things like, oh, well, our students aren't those traditional come, live, go four years. I mean, they never have been. Um, so there's always issues of access and there's always issues of trying to reach that diverse population of students. Um, Nanette was mentioning uh, cultural issues with, you know, knowledge of history and common experiences. John was mentioning, well, you know, I grew up with that concept preamble song and my students come from all over. We have, we're, you know, there's, there's people that come to my classes because they got introduced to the community college as ESL students because they were newly immigrant here. So I can't count on a common experience. I can't count on a common knowledge, and I never have been. It's not something that's really been changed very much in the community college setting. Um, and so again, those issues of being aware of that. Um, the preparedness, James was mentioning, you know, mobile and what kind of knowledge do students have to be students and how do they navigate through things. I mean, in our traditional classrooms, we have to do that with a lot of our students. We come with underprepared students many times who really need to know about how to navigate and how do I, they have to learn how to learn. <laughs> it's really part of it. And so in an online environment, when you don't have as much of that personal connection, um, it's very important. So I think a lot of the issues uh, that were addressed are sort of not necessarily brand new to me or eye-opening me, even in the context of MOOCs. Um, but in terms of trying to, to do things in ways that are new and innovative and different, and don't look at those as um, aspects of our students as obstacles, which many of my colleagues actually do. They think of them as obstacles to their ability to do their job. Um, I like to think of them as opportunities. What are the ways that we can actually um, use this technology and use these large groups with mul you know, multiple experiences and, and really harness that in a way that can create that more public, <laughs> I don't, again, not education, but sort of that, harness it in a way that can really um, help students um, become better engaged in their communities with each other, with their education in political science and beyond. So I think I'm, maybe I was here because I do online, I do fully online distance education, but I also think there's that perspective of uh, the, the student who maybe doesn't even intend to get a full degree who comes to the community college and just kind of wants to have that lifelong learning. MOOC seemed to fit in with that as well. So. That will be my conclusion for now. <laughs> okay, you, you witnessed what happens when you coordinate a panel with people you've never actually met. You, things kind of get hazy in one's mind, so I, I apologize. Um, so just to make sure, is there anyone else on the schedule? <laughs> okay, so um, now we can open things up for a discussion, and I'm gonna play Donahue or someone else, Jerry Springer I think is more appropriate. Um, I'll walk the mic around. The mic, that mic is not amplified, so um, just put it in front of your face and it's wireless so it'll get picked up on the video cam. Excellent idea. Do you want to start, Victor? No, by introducing yourself, and then you oh, can we're just... Not do, let's do it after the questions, so, but I'll okay. ask my question. Okay, so uh, MOOCs right now is really the monster, uh, and I mean that both in terms of uh, the size of what people are talking about, but also in terms of what a lot of academics are thinking about. Uh, the completion rates that you're seeing is terrifying. Uh, the threat of uh, people saying, well, we'll only have 100 universities or 10 universities and we'll fire all these other professors and all professors are going to become TAs and such, um, which uh, having been a TA, I don't aspire to. Uh, so how, and, and I think it's, it's a very different phenomena than online teaching. I mean, there's synchronous online teaching, there's asynchronous online teaching, they have very different aspects, 
very different pluses and minuses. I have strong feelings about one and the other. But MOOCs are a different animal. They're, okay, we'll get one really great professor from Harvard or Yale, they'll teach a course, we'll have a thousand students in it, we can fire all the other people. Uh, how much of a problem do you think this is and how credible is the MOOC Munster? Um, either as a, as a benefit or as a, uh, as a hopefully creative destroyer? Not to start on a grim note or anything. <laughs> brings an excellent question that should precede all others, and that is, what are MOOCs for? You know, I think uh, some of the issues that you raise, Victor, are because universities see MOOCs as sort of a replacement for in-class learning, and then they point to things like completion rates and enrollment and say that's a failure. But that's assuming that, you know, MOOCs are supposed to be a substitute. And, you know, I, I think that um, the way I look at it, in a way, is that MOOCs are an opportunity to engage broader publics about some basic information about the system and the world in which we live. So the goal is not completion rates. The goal is not enrollment rates. The goal is not even as a hook to get them to take my other online courses. But it's a public service. And I think APSA is sort of uniquely positioned to do that as opposed to universities because I don't think APSA should be concerned about completion rates or enrollment. But they should be concerned about providing a public service to the citizens of the country and the world. So that, I mean, I, but I think you're right. That, that people who criticize MOOCs often say that, well, what, what, what the completion rate is 10%, and then performance is even worse. Um, but, but I think that, I think we have to start with the question of what, if we were to do something like this, right, what would it be for? So, oh, by the way, are we introducing ourselves? I'm John. <laughs> <laughs> I got a problem. <laughs> Hi, I'm David Caputo. I'm Nanette Levinson, and I actually wanted to respond to Victor's superb question and comments and your superb answer. And I want to build on that. I think there actually is an opportunity for APSA to think about MOOCs and their purposes. And I've heard many of the pioneers in MOOCs provide a very similar, not, not similar in terms of what we can do as a profession, but saying that it was not the purpose. If you have 15,000 students and you only have, you know, 200 complete, that that is just fine, that that's not, you know, that is consistent with the purpose of the MOOC. So I think that that is a really important thing. But, Victor, you point to something that I think is really vital for all of us to grapple with. And that is, you talked about the impact of MOOCs on higher education writ large. And I'm particularly interested uh, on the impact on faculty, on professors in our field and in related fields. And one of the things that I'm seeing that is very fuzzy in the field of MOOCs and MOOCs implementation is um, both academic freedom and uh, questions of academic freedom and fuzzy areas and questions of intellectual property. And I am not a lawyer. We do have some wonderful lawyers within APSA. But a MOOC raises lots of questions. And the, um, I should mention that we are offering, not MOOCs, but we're offering our first online degree in international relations at my school. It's the first one in the field, um, um, fully online, with a for-profit partner. And I am not a part of that particular degree program. But what's interesting to me is it's, it's very attractive to students. It's doing extremely well in terms of enrollments. But I think there's still, from a faculty perspective, some very ambiguous areas. Because the model for that could be very similar to a model for MOOC. And that is that a um, tenured professor or a senior professor um, designs the MOOC receives a stipend from the university, but then that design, I'm not an expert on this, is no longer his or her property, and then TAs are hired to implement that course online in future renditions, and the senior professor supervises, quote unquote, and receives a very, very small stipend for that. So it's a, it raises very, very interesting questions. Um, I think for, for all of us as faculty 
and really for, for impacts, and that's why I really say that we've got to look at the administrative context as well as the academic context. And I don't want to keep talking, but I also want to remind us that assessment questions are really key. Who is going to think about the learning outcomes of the course? How is that to be done? Um, and these outside partners, what will their role really be in the future? I'm happy about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, good. Uh, my name's Alistair Blair. It's uh, on the ticket. I'm from the UK, and that's enough, I think. Yes, hello. I'm Stephen Curtis, also from the UK. I'm here representing the Higher Education Academy. Jeremy Cadell, US. <laughs> uh, Mark Johnson from uh, Moorhead, Minnesota, where it's colder than here. That's not hard. Uh, Victor Asal, I'm Albanian, or at least I'm from the University of Albany. <laughs> Julia Law Bertrand, I'm from Georgetown University, but I'm Singaporean. <laughs> Christy Bartman from American Public University System, and I'm Southern. My name is Santiago Leiva, I'm from uh, Colombia, South America. My name is Brian King, I teach at Muskingum University in Ohio, and I'm looking forward to my future as a tenured TA. <laughs> Hi, John Craig, uh, also from the UK and also from the Higher Education Academy. Hi, I'm Kimberly Bergendahl. I'm from the University of Connecticut. Hi, I'm Kathy Dopp. I'm from Albany, New York, and I am interested in research methods. Nancy Wright, Long Island University, Brooklyn. I live in New York City. I'm American. Rick Foster, Pikes Peak Community College, Colorado Springs. I'm John Berg from Suffolk University in, in Boston. I'm Sarah Moots from uh, Florida International University. I uh, am initially from West Virginia, and as I flew in last night, I realized it's winter here. <laughs> My name's John Dove. I'm actually an odd man out here because I'm from a publisher. Uh, an aggregator of reference, Credo Reference. We create an online encyclopedia that's as big as Wikipedia, but all from credible sources. And I'm interested in the teaching and learning of particular political science because it overlaps a lot with not only academics, but also public libraries in terms of what is citizenship. So I learned a lot from last year's conference and look forward to this one. Hi, I'm Jackie DeVore. I'm from the University of Maryland, and I'll be sharing shortly um, our experiences building and delivering a MOOC that's currently running right now. And I'm Tressa Tabaris, and I'm from uh, American River College in California. And I, I'm expecting my voice to project. Um, I know that Victor is running an identity exercise, so we're not going <laughs> to exclude anybody in the back. <laughs> Uh, Dmitry Roman Kulchitsky, teach at the American University of Kuwait in the International Relations Department. Uh, I'm Ukrainian American. Tina Zapilli from Stockton College across the bridge that was, did not get blocked. <laughs> uh, Joseph Coelho from Seton Hill University outside of Pittsburgh. I'm Alison Stafford from Montford University in the UK. Janet Day, I teach at SUNY Oneonta in New York. And I'm Jennifer Diaspora, I'm on the staff of APSA. Welcome. Now there's, oh, here we go. Nanette, a uh, couple of questions for you. The first one, when you have those, the course that you did, the IR online, do you limit your class size? Well, okay, I'll ask both questions. If you um, number one on the limit of the class size, number two, can you give us more detail on the N, the S, the P, whatever the <laughs> ones you were you had up on the? I'm not certain about that second question. We, oh yes, absolutely. I'll tell you about the X and the C MOOC. Um, why don't I start with that and then I'll just go to class size um, for the. Okay, the 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 C MOOC is the closed MOOC. The, let me start with the X MOOC. The X MOOC is the, is the massive open MOOC, the traditional MOOC. 
And as many people, and I think this discussion has taken place in Great Britain in great detail, one of the challenges of the, of the ex-MOOC is the possible absence of focus on engagement with the students. And so as a response to that, people have designed the C MOOC, which is a closed MOOC, which I believe more limited in size, that then gets you to this idea that John Hennessy put forward, which is the very small and private, which is almost going back to the online learning that all of us have been talking about this morning. And I am sure, and the, oh, and the, the British, the French government model, the acronym FUN, is just a name for the um, French government initiative to promote MOOCs. They did not define MOOCs in detail, but their dream is uh, to provide education in French for the Francophone world. However, my partner school, Sciences Po in Paris, has been very uh, rebellious, and it is offering one MOOC right now uh, from Bruno Latour, who is an expert, actually is pretty well known in, in his own field, but he insisted that that MOOC be given in English. However, um, I guess I'm going to put the microphone down for one second, cover the microphone, and I'm going to give you a piece of data. I signed up for the French MOOCs as a good researcher when I was in France this fall. When I tried to access the MOOC that began on January 15th, I received an error message saying, this is not open to your region of the world. Now, I am going to follow up on it to see, to see if that is accurate, uh, because indeed, the words of the uh, French Foreign Minister, the Minister of Education, were that these were indeed supposed to be open to the world. So it may be just a technical glitch, <laughs> but it's fascinating fact du jour. Now let me get back. Let me get back to class size. Um, we have currently um, enrolled in our IR about 67 students. We limit classes. That it's my understanding as a faculty member not in the program, that each class is limited to, limited to about 35 students because you need to know that this is synchronous online even though it is all around the world. The class is taught mainly synchronously with also asynchronous components. And I will tell you that the, our partner is something called 2U, which used to be called 2Tour. There are three or four or five actors. I don't want to take time now for that. Some of you may be mentioning those actors. But 2U picks one program and partners with a different university for that field. So one for, I think they have one for public administration, a different university. They do IR with American University. Um, they do education with the University of Southern California. Uh, there are several other that they do. But they actually do provide phenomenal technical support for faculty. They have an amazing studio. Um, and they provide not only technical support for faculty, they provide complete support for students. So they are the library for students, they are career placement for students. This is another issue maybe for another learning mode, but I wanted to be sure to answer. Um, did that answer that for you? Okay, thanks. Um, as I'm walking, I'll, I'll mention one thing about what it's like uh, in the trenches, so to speak. I teach in a master's degree IR program that's both on campus and uh, online, asynchronous. When I first started in 2008, online courses, they would split into two sections as soon as enrollment hit 16. So you get two sections of eight, and that would be, you know, additional course in my teaching load. Now, it doesn't split until 25, okay? So there are universities that are looking at, okay, this is our cost structure, this is what we gotta do to, to keep you know, generating the revenue. Um, and all of us as faculty were getting squeezed. On the opposite end, you have Peter Norvig and Sebastian Thrun. The first time they offered their I AI, artificial intelligence MOOC at Stanford before they basically quit and said, see you later. Um, they taught more people artificial intelligence than had ever been taught the subject before in that one MOOC. 
Hi, as educators, we're, we uh, make the distinction between the transference of knowledge and critical thinking. And I wonder how we can understand MOOCs in the context of that discussion. Because we utilize various techniques in our classroom and in our courses to encourage critical thinking. And I'm just wondering, if you have 35,000 students, a lot of those uh, techniques to encourage critical thinking seem impossible. So. I was just curious how people might respond to that concern as educators. Yeah, John Berg. It's yeah, similarly. I mean, when I heard Jim Quirk talking, uh, he says, "Okay, you take these tests, and if you get it wrong, it refers you back to the lecture where you get the correct information." So, so I'm thinking. Banking, right? Paulo Freire would call this the banking model. And it can be very good, right? I, I once had to get certified to do human subjects research, and I had to take this completely automated online thing, and it worked just like that. <laughs> and at the end, it, pr it printed a certificate which, which would let the I IRB think it could talk to me, right? And that was, that was, that was good. But uh, is, there, is there a thought in the MOOC community about this is good for this, but it's not good for that, and we're going to come up with a mix. Hi, I'm <coughs> um, my boss has given me the job of uh, taking some meta MOOCs, which is basically take some MOOCs and then report back on the experience. And <coughs> it's interesting, um, Professor Rocket at Penn gave a talk just last week here in Philadelphia. He said, we're now, right now in the Alta Vista stage of MOOCs. So part of my job, I actually interviewed Daphne Kohler and as well as the head of the EDX. And uh, it's, Daph you know, Coursera is less than two years old right now. So what, and there are 20 different platforms around MOOCs. And they're going to do all kinds of things. So indeed, the fellow who's, in, I forget his name at the moment, the fellow who's in charge of EDX, he basically says, indeed, MOOCs are not a replacement for what goes on in the classroom. It actually allows you to free up a lot of the classroom opportunities to do the stuff where the magic happens. And that's where, coming back to your question about um, how, how does MOOCs affect the whole question of attitude, uh, I think it's attributed to Paul Bloom that there are three things you can teach or learn. There's knowledge, there's skills, and there's attitude or affect. And a lot of online things do really well in terms of skills and knowledge, and maybe sometimes they're inspirational. But the kind of opportunity for this face-to-face -face, um, student, a teacher as a mentor sees a student and confronts them and says, you know, you're not challenging yourself. You are selling yourself short. You could be much more. You could do much more with your life than you are now. That's not likely to happen in the, in the MOOC situation. But the key question is, do MOOCs open up the opportunity for more of that to go on in the whole panoply of what's offered? So I think it's a, it's a complex set of questions. Um, I just have a couple of questions. Aren't MOOCs awfully expensive, requiring a lot of equipment and um, you know, a team of technical people, essentially system administrators, audiovisual people, reliable internet services and backup systems? And given the expense, um, what what features of a particular MOOC or what facets need to be present for the, you know, the economics to work for a MOOC? And my second question is, could someone just def define synchronous versus asynchronous MOOCs for me, please? Thank you. I'm going to go over to Jackie for the response to the first question. Second question is, asynchronous simply means you can be anywhere at any time and still access the course content and interact with whoever you're supposed to interact with. So you not you don't actually have to be online at 9 p.m. on a Friday evening or something like that. Well, I'm not sure how much detail I should go into just yet, but I'll be talking about it a bit more when I share our experiences with the MOOC. Um, it my name is Jackie DeVore at the University of Maryland. So we're currently running a MOOC right now. We're in our second week, right in the middle of the trenches. So I have a lot of lessons learned and we'll have many more in four more weeks when it's over. Um, it has been a relatively inexpensive process. That being said, that directly correlates to the quality of your course. Um, technologically, the more money you have, the more um, 
of a better recording studio, the quality that you have of your videos. Um, I know Jim um, mentioned in his video that it's not necessarily about the technology. Um, in the first two weeks of my course, I'm seeing it a, a bit differently. The students have very high expectations of the quality video that they want to be watching. They want a high definition cinema type movie, um, which hurt my feelings a bit at the beginning. Um, but it, I mean, there's there's a value to that. Um, it's so I think you can you can touch on this with you know the different modes of how you're communicating the topics with the video with the scripts with the powerpoint slides with all of those different means are definitely necessary and so you kind of have a careful balancing act of how much resource you want to put into the video and how much resource you can put into the script and the slides etc so our course definitely I'm, I'm happy with the content that we have in there the meat the material that it's there and as we continue to edit it we're going to include more video type editing techniques and um, hopefully find more students and interns and graduate students who have those experiences as we don't have the resources right now to kind of throw a bunch of money in. Um, but to give a ballpark number, we spent about $8,000 on our course and I'll be showing you a bit more. It's pretty basic when it comes to the technologies that we used. Victor, did you still want to respond? There's this amalgamation of online and MOOC, and online and MOOC are not the same thing. I mean, there are all sorts of online tools that are very useful. I'm a big fan of synchronous online learning. I have real trepidation about asynchronous, but the MOOC part of MOOCs that makes me very nervous is the M. It's the massive. And I think it's real important that we draw a distinction between online classes, 60 people classes, 50 people classes. That's nothing like they're talking about when Coursera first came out. And so for me, that's the real difference. And for a, a course like Start, where you're doing general learning and people want to learn, I agree with you, John. That, that, has that, um, that has that advantage. But there are provosts and presidents around the country who are seeing this to actually teach for credit. And and that, I think, is the problem. Well, I think that's the potential problem. The, the MOOCs where people learn so they can learn, great. The MOOCs where we're giving credit for somebody who's in a 5,000 person course. This, of course, assumes that credit is still going to be important for the people that are looking for these kind of learning opportunities. This is a 10 second factoid. There are now courses in other fields, not in our field, where face-to-face -face classes on the syllabus, a requirement is a MOOC that provides some basic information. So it's interesting to know about that option as well. Uh, let me try to address the two points. Uh, Victor's point. Uh, I'm going to be talking about this specifically tomorrow when I present my paper. Uh, and so I don't want to get into it today, except to say that I think a lot of these fears are, are not as uh, I don't want to say are ungrounded, but I think we already know that MOOCs are not going to do everything that everyone said they were going to do, at least not as they're currently designed. Going back to the question about expenses, I think that's a very important question. Uh, one of the things I'll be doing in a, about an hour, I think, right after break, is talking about how uh, I cobbled together a variety of sources and resources in order to put together a MOOC, uh, which will start shortly. Uh, but I think it's a very v important one. I think the thing that matters, though, is you have to be fully committed to it. Uh, you have to, and, and if you do that, you can usually draw in and call on enough resources across campus and other things. It may not be quite as high quality as you might like and other people might like, but it's a beginning, and from there you can build. And I think that's one of the things that's important. We all tend to think of a MOOC as a one-time event and, and never gets uh, redone, never gets uh, improved on, and I think I'm sure that uh, all of us who are, who are doing these see this as a logical progression. And I, ho I would hope that all of you in the room will, uh, by the time we're done today, have some real feeling for what it takes to do a MOOC, and if you're do doing one, also what it takes to improve it. Because I think it really it does have a lot of uh, good applications, not just in terms of the classroom, but also in terms of the civic education, civic competency. of an actual MOOC. Okay, actually this is a great conversation. This is exactly what I thought this should start out as. You know, uh, is MOOC, are MOOCs good things? Uh, and what is a MOOC for? 
And that's exactly what we're touching upon here. And I think Victor is absolutely right. The problem with the way MOOCs have been operationalized, they've been seen in the old way that they're course replacements, they're revenue generators, and of course, enrollments matter to provosts who think of them as revenue generators. You know, I think of there are two different kinds of uh, classes my local community college offers, right? One is college prep, and the other one is adult skills training. And so they offer things like, um, you know, learning a language or learning how to turn on your computer or how to work with Word or Excel or something like that. And that for adults, they're not really taking it to uh, take college credit to proceed on. They're taking it to know something. And I think that, you know, the way I think of MOOCs is it's an opportunity to do something other than offer college credit, but offer an opportunity for people to know something, for adult skills training in a way. Um, you know, I think APSA is uniquely positioned to do something in this area because we don't offer credit. We, we don't offer things like uh, a credit for transfer to college and enrollments are not nearly as important, but we can offer a public service and adult skills training, if you will. Um, you know, Chautauqua so, or something, something, something like that. I think that, that's, that's how I think of it. It may be different from how it's been operationalized, but it, it's sort of been a unique beast if we pursue it in this way. Now, of course, there are expenses. That's, that's important. And I think something that <laughs> is going to come up at some point in time is that how do you measure success if it's adult skills? I mean, it's easy to measure if it's for college prep, then you go by enrollment, completion rates, retention, et cetera. But what if it's for about adult skills training? How do you know it's successful? Well, I think I would, I'm with John in terms of the, the thinking about them very differently in terms of um, what they can offer and then also what students are expecting from them. I mean, why is a student taking this class? Are they expecting to earn credit? Are they expecting to get a little bit of knowledge? Are they expecting to build a skill? Maybe something that's going to get them to then be able to take that credit course um, with a little more background, with a little more preparation, with a little more you know, um, but the other thing I was I was thinking about in terms of the you know how does it differ from online because that is definitely um, a big piece of it and it's it's partially based on okay well how is that curriculum determined um, very different if we're again in California there's sort of discussion of how do we um, it's not just about you know, doing things cheaply, but how do we reach more students who don't have, I mean, you know, if you're living in a small little town and you have one little community college, that community college can't necessarily offer all the things a student may want to take and how do you make connections and, and have students, and students can certainly learn how to take an <coughs> online course here and an online course here, but it's still discreet to that college, and so then they have to worry about transcript articulation, and so there's some discussion in California about how we can sort of make this something that, again, what are some online offerings, maybe some MOOCs, that then local community colleges can create and, and you can utilize, I guess, in pieces of it in your traditional class. Go do this and then come back to the traditional class so it's a connection of resources for students and faculty. And I think that's an interesting area as well where you kind of put them as almost this collection of online library sort of opportunities for, st for people who maybe don't have the resources to sort of develop these, these on their own and offer them for students. So there's lots of different things that are being discussed about the utilization and what students would expect and what will faculty expect and what administrators expect from this online education, both in the traditional online class setting and in this massive or open setting. So I think that that's really sort of something that's going on very, very much in all fields. In